Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this latest session of the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Uh, I'm Magnus Linklater, and I'm delighted to introduce Trevor Royal, who has written <coughs> this fascinating book, Facing the Bear, which I think for the first time uh, explores the role of Scotland in the Cold War. Um, Trevor is journalist, historian, and indefatigable researcher, uh, has got interested in it really from a visit to Soviet Russia at the sort of height of the Cold War, and has gone back and explored what role Scotland actually played. And it was quite a significant role, wasn't it? Yes, indeed. In fact, it was less about history and more about geography. If history is about chaps, then geography is about maps. And if you look at r Scotland's place in the geopolitical area of NATO's northern flank, you find that Scotland is pushing right up towards the Soviet, what was the Soviet Union, the Kola Peninsula. Now, that's very important because it was there from bases in the Kola Peninsula that Soviet warships and Soviet bombers would attack the West. The reason why? It's guarding the very important Greenland-Iceland-UK gap. This is an area with fantastic strategic importance, even today, even though the Cold War has been consigned to history. It's very important because it was there that Soviet attack submarines would launch themselves into the Atlantic and then beyond to the eastern seaboard of the United States, thereby threatening the American homeland. Yeah, and that um, listening post or sig uh, signals place right up at the top of Shetland, Saxaford. Saxaford. Yes. Saxaford. Uh, what was the significance? What was it doing? Well, Saxaford was previously you know, uh, unrecognized. Quite honestly, it was part of the Shetland Island group. It's the northernmost island in that group. And it was there that, first of all, during the Second World War, um, a radar post was put in to look out for g attacking German bombers, coming in that, this case from Norway. But throughout the Cold War, Saxaford was the long stop. It was on the same latitude as St. Petersburg, um, Leningrad during the Cold War. And it was there that um, the British were able to pick up the first signals of r Soviet intentions so that if Soviet bombers were attacking from the north, if Soviet submarines were coming towards the Gr Greenland, Iceland, UK gap, they would have been the first to know about it. Now, this is very important because they had a hotline from Saxaford directly to the Quick Reaction Alert Squadron at RAF Lucas and Fife. And great was the excitement when they'd get a signal that Soviet bombers are about to attack Britain and up would go um, lightnings or phantoms from RAF Lucas to intercept um, these giant TU-95 bombers. And this became one of the important motifs of the Cold War. And it was milked by the British government for all that it was worth because the sight of British fighters going up to intercept these giant bombers, and believe you me, they really are huge. They're still in service today a signal of um, Soviet longevity in um, aircraft production. But these photographs were used by, as propaganda photographs throughout the Cold War, of British aircraft, our brave fighter boys, memories of the Battle of Britain still strong, of course, um, going up there to um, intercept these giant bombers. Now, this is a, an extraordinary thing. What happened that these were bombers were nothing of the kind. They were a bomber-type aircraft, but they were oper operating in the maritime surveillance role and were just going about their legal business. There was no threat to the United Kingdom whatsoever. But um, hey-ho, that's what happened during um, the so Cold War. Propaganda was equally important as actual um, actions themselves. But, and you had a very funny story about how the uh, Soviet uh, tail gunners <laughs> would, would deliberately have their lunch in the in in the rear of the aircraft and wave their chicken bones. Well, that's base. right. I, I was brought up in St Andrews, and um, next door to St Andrews was uh, the major RAF base at Lucas. And uh, playing rugby, we played rugby against um, the uh, RAF base, and we got to know the pilots quite well. They were an interesting bunch of people. And I asked them about this. I said, you know, what's it like to be at the end of a quick reaction alert? And they said, well, it's very exciting to begin with, because you get yourself strapped into <laughs> your Lightning, because that was the a fantastic aircraft, um, 
very, very fast, but it almost had to be refueled by the time it took off. You, you'd, you'd go up there and you'd intercept these huge aircraft. And of course, they got to know them. They flew up close to them, and the, t the tail gunner in these giant Tu-95 would, they'd be eating their lunch, they'd open up their baskets, and of course, you can see everything, you're right up against it. And they'd wave bits of chicken at them, and um, cakes, and bread, and um, it was it just seemed to be a game. <laughs> But it wasn't all a game, and there were some... Uh, tell us about some of the key locations. I mean, one of the interesting bits, you home in on um, uh, RAF Edsel mm -hmm. in Aberdeenshire, uh, which nobody... I mean, throughout the Cold War, the assumption was that that was an RAF base, but it wasn't. It was a US base, wasn't it? Yes, this happened I in, at Edsel. It was the only instance of it happening in Scotland, but um, it was common throughout the home counties in England, especially in the Cotswolds, where RAF bases like Lakenheath um, were called RAF Lakenheath, and they were nominally under the control of, a, of an RAF officer. But that was just a shield. I mean, they were taken, they were, it was being operated by the US Air Force, and the local um, RAF officer was no more than a community officer who was there to deal with road traffic accidents and incidents of bad behavior and all the rest of it. Edsel was slightly different because it was a US naval facility and it operated under the name of RAF Edsel because that's what it had been before the US Navy took it over. It was an RAF um, base during the Second World War and then it had been used for go-kart racing and I discovered to my great delight the RAF Edsel was the last place where the, late, where the great Jim Clark, the motor racing champion, raced as a boy in his go-kart. But it had a much more serious um, role to play during the Cold War because it was the part of, it was run by the US um, intelligence group, US Naval Intelligence Group, and its job had only one purpose. It was to listen in to radio broadcasts from any part of the world in which Soviets um, radio traffic was being heard. So it had a very important role to play. And the importance of getting SIGINT, as it was called, Signals Intelligence, was vital to the Royal Navy and to the US Navy, because that was fed directly to um, the Polaris submarines, which operated from the west coast of Scotland, from Faz Lane for the Royal Navy, and Holy Loch for the US Navy. So today, the village of Edsel is a delightful little place. It nestles in the lee of the eastern Cairngorms. It's got a nice Edwardian feel, some lovely arts and crafts houses. And the base itself, well, it's still there. It's not being used by the US Navy, and it probably never will be, although you speak to people in the streets of Edsel, and they say, why, they're coming back soon, they're coming back to the base. <laughs> but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. But well, al although, and this is slightly jumping ahead, although, Saxaford, of which you spoke earlier, which was decommissioned, has been brought back. Saxaford has come back from the dead. It's done a Lazarus Act. Um, when the REF moved out in 2005, it was thought that was the end of all things, and Saxaford was t became fair play to the Shetlanders. To begin with, when it became clear that the RAF was going to leave Saxaport, everybody said, well, this is terrible because we depend on this RAF base. Because although there were never more than 90 service personnel there, they provided medical services, dental services, and they brought money into the community. Well, blow me, Saxaford came back from the dead and was turned into a tourist attraction. And incidentally, not that I've tasted it, a gin distillery. <laughs> which is uh, quite a nice way to, you know, the spirit of cold. But it's cold still, cold. but it, what I mean is it's been brought back as an observation post. Well, it? yes, it was closed down, but then a couple of years ago, fortunately, when the Ministry of Defence decided to close Saxaford, they left the infrastructure intact. A wise precaution, because nobody knew what was going to happen. And then a couple of years ago, as um, the incidents of Soviet aircraft incursions began to uh, multiply, and as um, more ships began to be seen in the area coming from Russia, they decided to reactivate Saxophone. So it is once again what it was during the Cold War, right. with the notable exception that the personnel aren't there. It's now being fully automated. Oh, really? Yes, <laughs> what a terrible signal to all of us, I think, what can happen. Indeed.
Um, but let's look at um, the decisions that lay behind these US, mainly US uh, installations and bases. How did that come about? And did Scotland have any say in all of this? Well, the major presence in Scotland came from the United States Navy, not at Edsel, but at Holy Loch, which, which became a forward operating base for the 14th Submarine R Squadron. And it was there that um, the Americans were able to base their Polaris armed um, submarines. These were very large submarines, a breakthrough in technology, which could go anywhere in the world and be virtually unseen. But they needed a forward operating base because they were operating on the other side of the Atlantic from the United States. And um, their, their crews had to be changed regularly, so they needed an air force base nearby. Well, the nearest one to um, Holy Loch, of course, is Prestwick, you know, the Scotland's transatlantic airport. And the story of how that came about is one of the sort of murkiest and um, most interesting of the post-war period. Um, we've got to go back to the late 1960s, and Britain was still pretending that it was a nuclear power. Well, it was pretending because it had atom bombs. It had um, the capacity to uh, destroy um, the, the, the Soviet Union. But it didn't really have a good means of delivering the, the atom bomb to its destination. The preferred way of doing it, and the existing way in the late, 19, in the late 1950s, was the V-bomber force. These were big jet engine bombers which were capable of flying to the Soviet Union, dropping their bomb, and then, well, not coming back because it was a one of the dirty secrets of the Cold War that these V-bombers, while they were very effective and um, could do their, the job in hand, didn't have sufficient fuel to fly to the Soviet Union and then to return to the United Kingdom. So these guys, the crew of six, were basically on a one-way mission. Did they know that? They knew about it, but it was never discussed. When one pilot did discuss it, he said they said he was given this advice by a senior officer. Look, my man, drop your bomb, then continue flying east, land your, crash land your bomber, and then settle down with n some nice, big, warm Mongolian woman. <laughs> <laughs> that was his, um, the preferred advice. And the other thing, too, was it was quite extraordinary. Um, because of the flash from the atom bomb, or the hydrogen bomb, they were g given a patch which you wore over one eye. And that meant that when you were making the return, when you were turning round after the bomb had gone off, you took your patch off and you were blind in this eye, but this eye you could still see. And um, in that really meant that in the one, this is giving the truth to the story, that in the, one, in the kingdom of the blind, the one-eyed man really is king, or was king. He was the pilot of a V-bomb. So from the realms of fiction, yes. really. Yes. Extraordinary. <coughs> but just going back to the decisions that were made with between Prime Minister Macmillan mm. and the Americans, des we were desperate to get the Polaris submarine. Uh, those decisions were taken presumably without any reference to local politicians or even Scottish ministers, the Secretary of State for Scotland presumably knew about it, but did Scotland have any say in it? None whatsoever, no, no. And we've got to remember that um, in 1960, 60, 61, when the decision was taken by the British government to invite the Americans to Holy Loch, um, Harold Macmillan um, was an old Etonian, but he excited rather different um, emotions than the current uh, old Etonian Prime Minister that we have. <laughs> Um, he was no Boris Johnson, certainly, but he was well respected. And anyway, he, he was seen, how shall I put it, he was seen as a gent. You know, he went shooting in Scotland every August. <laughs> he, w he wore tweed suits. He knew he was new to keep out of London in, in the month of August. And people just didn't question what he did. But what he did do was quite simple. He knew that this V-bomber force with the one-eyed <coughs> pilots was about to become obsolescent. He wanted to keep Britain at the top table. Keeping Britain at the top table and keeping its place in the Security Council meant having a nuclear deterrent. What, 
he asked the Americans for help. And he had good reason of success because he was related by marriage to, um, through his wife, to the wife of the US president, John F. Kennedy. And I think he did use as much um, personal influence as he possibly could. What he was looking for was a missile called Skybolt. Now, the thing about Skybolt was that it could be strapped underneath a V-bomber, and they could fly towards the Soviet Union, and then a few hundred miles north of, uh, west of their targets, they could launch the missiles, thereby escaping the increased um, air defenses around Moscow, because Moscow was the real target. It was known as the Moscow Criterion. You had to be able to hit Moscow uh, to be able to have a chance of remaining at the top table. So Skybolt was a preferred option, and everybody thought it was terrific. And this was sold to the British government as the means of keeping Britain a nuclear power. Unfortunately, um, Skybolt was a dud. It was completely useless. Now, don't take my word for it. Take the word of the Defense Secretary, Robert McNamara. He knew it was a dud, so he set about cancelling it. And what he wanted to replace it with was a new kind of missile, which could be launched from a submarine while it was still submerged. And that submarine, that missile was known as Polaris. Hmm. The, the, um, uh, that, that kind of decision uh, did evoke protests, obviously, in the aftermath. Um, and indeed, those protests still go on. But th there are other places where installations were made. For instance, Ben Bekula, where there was a rocket uh, missile launching station, wasn't there? Yes, there was a rocket range. Um, it was based at Ben Bekula, and this was used for testing um, tactical battlefield weapons. These are weapons which weren't strategic. They weren't designed to be fired against the Soviet Union, but they were designed for battlefield use in Europe. And uh, funnily enough, um, it was very important that these weapons were regularly tested. And they were tested not by a resident regiments in Ben Bekula, but by artillery regiments which came each year from West Germany to Ben Bekula to fire these um, missiles into the Atlantic. Yeah. Now, when Ben Bekula, when it was announced that Britain's um, tactical battlefield m weapons were going to be tested at Ben Bekula, there were huge protests. You know, people thought this is dreadful, this is going to be the end of Gallic culture as we know it. And um, these were led by the Catholic Church in Ben Bekula, who were in the majority. In fact, one of the fathers there who became so noisy in his, um, in his protest that he immediately was known as Father Rocket. <laughs> and um, funnily enough, nothing happened. Gallic culture is still alive in Ben Becula, and it didn't die off. And uh, I think um, it benefited the Western Isles completely. It brought a lot of employment into the area. Well, but isn't it right that not only were there protests <laughs> about the rockets arriving, but there were protests when they were decommissioned and were going to be removed. Oh, when they were going to be removed, the same protests were heard even louder. And funnily enough, the same arguments were used. And it was quite extraordinary. Um, looking at the papers from the late 1950s, early 1960s, when it was being developed, the destruction of Gallic culture, the ruination of the local community, when they were going to be, when it was going to be closed down in the 21st century, reading the same newspapers, you got the same arguments. Ruination of the Gallic culture, poor, 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 you know, poverty for the local inhabitants. But it didn't happen either, because the, the base is still open and still used, because we, like Saxaford, it's um, there for an uncertain future. Yes. And there was a very nice, one of Compton Mackenzie's lesser-known novels, Rockets Galore, was about set in Lenbecula, wasn't it? Yes, I mean, Compton Mackenzie, who, who lived up in that area, he um, had made a lot of money out of uh, his very famous and very funny novel, Whiskey Galore, which was made into a film. He capitalized on it, um, less successfully, I may say, uh, uh, a, a novel called Rocket Scholar, which al was also made into a film. And it hung on the, the premise that um, the presence of the rockets and the new technology in the Western Isles would have a deleterious effect on the local wildlife. Yeah. 
and he got the local the, the island of Toddy. He got the islanders got together and they managed to paint all the seabirds pink. <laughs> thereby proving, you know, that something terrible was happening to the local bird population. Um, just coming back to bases where the Americans seemed to think that they had an overriding right to decide how to use them. Prestwick, for instance, that, that was a decision, wasn't it, taken where the Americans had decided that Prestwick would be a good forward operational base, and they more or less... Uh, went ahead, but that didn't happen. No, Pre Prestwick was a very important air, air base for both the British and the Americans throughout the Cold War because it was the Brit Scotland's only transatlantic airfield and it was fog free, which was very important in an era, era when you couldn't land an airline unless you could actually see what, see what was happening. Not like today, was, uh, you know, modern air electronics and all the rest of it. But they needed a forward operating base in Scotland and in England. Why did they need it? Well, it wasn't because they wanted to bring people hit willy-nilly. In the event of a nuclear war breaking out with the Soviet Union, Britain would, had to, would have to be reinforced. And um, they knew that the sea lanes were compromised, so most of the reinforcements would have to come in by air. And of their own volition, they decided that Prestwick would be the most suitable place for bringing in supplies and reinforcing Britain in the event of war with the Soviet Union. And they set about with plans which were very far advanced for the reconstruction of Prestwick Airport and the kind of base facilities that you would need, the construction of big warehouses, uh, extended runways and all the rest of it. Did they, they, but they, used, they made these plans almost using Prestwick as if it was their own facility, that they were owned part of, uh, that was a part of Ayrshire, which will be forever the United States. Fortunately, the Scottish press got to hear about it and started digging around and came up with irrefutable evidence that this was about to happen. Now, the government did what governments should never do when faced with this kind of problem. They swore that nothing was going to happen. They swore for all that they were worth, that there was no, no plans, that this was all a, a complete nonsense until the evidence became so strong that they had to admit to it. And then it was called off. It was they, called off completely, yes. But of course, the thing is, it <coughs> because of um, the fact that the Scottish secretary at that time, who had been caught up in it, George Younger, who I always respected and thought was a terrific politician and a great man, he created such a fuss about it that Prestwick was not only taken off the American list, but um, they decided that uh, a little known and previously unknown airfield in Gloucestershire would do just as well. Shame. And that became the forward operation. Let, let's base. look at the whole question of how close a Cold War came to becoming a hot war. And we all know about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but one of the things that you uh, have absolutely fascinating detail about <coughs> are the Polaris subs and the encounters between uh, American and British submarines and Russians. Uh, and these were very, very close encounters, weren't they? They were, because um, Holy Loch and Faz Lane were home not just to the boomers, the bombers, the, the Polaris ca was carrying submarines, which um, whose job was to go out into the oceans of the world and then disappear completely for eight weeks at a time. It was home to another kind of submarine. They were known variously as attack submarines or hunter-killer submarines, and their job was to do the exact opposite. And they went north from Vaslane and Holy Loch up to the Barents Sea, up to the Norwegian Sea, under the, Pol under the Arctic ice cap, and their job there was to hunt out their Soviet opposite numbers and to look at what they were up to. Now, in an intelligence war of that kind, the only reason, the only way to find out how the enemy is progressing, what their capabilities are, is to go up there and test them. And that's what they did. They played a dangerous game of cat and mouse underneath the Arctic waters and remember, they, you can't see what your opposite number's doing. It's not like being in a ship at sea where you've got an odds-on chance of being able to find out what's happening. These were below the surface. 
and they were having to operate with only electronic means, sonar, sonars. And this led to great, terrible adventures, quite honestly. And I spoke to vari various um, submarine captains. In fact, a great friend of mine commanded w w one of them, um, Trafalgar. And some of the stories he told me about the, that hidden war beneath the uh, waves was utterly mind-boggling. If any of you have seen that movie, The Hunt for Red October, or read the novel, Tom Clancy's novel, Sean Connery's in the film, he plays a, a Soviet um, submarine captain, and it, it allowed a phrase used from that um, period to come into I I the English language usage. Crazy Ivan, he's doing a crazy Ivan. And that was when the two submarines would be hunting each other below, the wall. and if you, that's one submarine, that's the other, you're coming towards each other, and you leave it until the last minute till you move off. And the Soviets were adept at doing this, and the Royal Naval Captain said, oh, it's all right, he's only doing a crazy Ivan, and as if that made it all right. But there were collisions, and w most famously, and most horrifically, one of our most famous submarines, HMS Warspike, got a bit too close. It had a close encounter too far. It was um, shadowing a Soviet um, hunter-killer submarine, they got too close to each other, and suddenly, to the horror of the crew of War Spite, and remember, you're below the waves here, you're in d you don't know what's happening at all. They heard a noise rather like a, uh, a can opener going along the top of the submarine, and it grated right along, and they didn't know what on earth was happening, and what had happened was that the Soviet submarine was just above them, and the noise they heard was the screw of the Soviet submarine going along the top of their hull. Now, this must have been absolutely terrifying because you've got no hope of um, getting away from this any time quickly. So they, they had to wait until it was safe to do so. War spite surfaced, and they looked at the damage, and true enough, right along the top of the hull, as far as the fin, the conning tower, it was completely ripped open by the Soviet submarine screw. How did they survive? Terrific engineering, and um, the pluck of the crew, nobody panicked, and the skill of the commanding officer, who did all the right things, and also, let it be said, the decision by the Soviet captain to break off the engagement. They looked at the damage, they had to get back to Britain somehow. They made their way to Shetland, on the surface? On the surface, yes, at, at night, and um, they, they made it to uh, Shetland, where they were jury-rigged and um, some elementary repairs were done, and then base the, the submarine made its way back to Barrow and Furness, where it had been originally built, and um, the crew were sworn to secrecy and were told to say that if the <coughs> anybody mentioned damage, that war spite had collided with, a, with an iceberg. And that wasn't the only incident during the co Cold War. All these things were covered up at the time, oh, weren't yes, they? Yes. I mean, we we didn't we, we didn't really know anything about any of this till years later. No, um, it was the we had to wait until the 21st century. In fact, it's only in the last 10 years that the papers um, relating to these incidents have been made public. But uh, during the Cold War, nothing was um, released at all because of. Um, operational, yeah. the ne need for operational secrecy. There were also encounters with fishing boats. I mean, it was really quite a dangerous waters, those waters off Faslane and the Holy Loch, where the exercises were being carried out. And there were stories about fishing boats getting their nets getting caught up with the, the submarines. Yes, the, um, the, uh, it, this came about really because if you look at the waters of the west coast of Scotland, especially the <coughs> approaches to Paz Lane and Holy Loch, um, they're <coughs> ideal for submarine operations because you've got rapid access to deeper waters. But the problem is that, of course, this is also where another type of fishing, of a vessel, was operating, fishing boats, inshore fishing boats. And this came about, the reason why there were, in, uh, there were accidents was that you've got a classic example of two different kinds of, of vessel 
using the same waters for different purposes, and there were bound to be problems, and there were. And the most infamous incident, um, again because it was covered up, um, involved the, the attack submarine trenchant and a fishing boat called the Antares. And what happened here was that um, trenchant was being used for submarine training, the, the perisher course, um, the very strict and very difficult and demanding course for training submarine captains, where, you, where you're being taught under wartime conditions, operational conditions, and there's no room for error. And what happened was that trenchant was, operated, was, op was being tested. Antares was on the surface. It was going about its legal business, fishing, and the fishing gear got caught up on, uh, on trenchant, and uh, Antares was dragged to its doom. Trenchant surfaced, couldn't see anything, and got on with the, the course. And again, nothing was said, and it was only the persistent interest of the Scottish press, which made sure that this incident was um, given publicity, and eventually the Navy had to come clean, admit that this had happened, and they also said that they would act in closer contact <coughs> with the uh, fishing community on the west coast of Scotland yeah. before, um, yeah. before doing <coughs> it. Let's go back to the beginning of the book, because it's one of your theses that um, you didn't think, you don't think, that the Soviet threat was quite as formidable as perhaps it was played up to be, and that there was an, <clears throat> an element about the Cold War which was artificial, almost promoted by the military-industrial complex on both sides, and that y you felt that the Soviet Union was really in no condition to, to face up to the West in reality. Well, by, by the... 1970s, everything rested on the policy of mutual assured des <coughs> destruction, where nobody would f would re release their uh, hydrogen weapons because it would mean not only the destruction of the enemy but the destruction of their own country. So this was the mutual assured discussion um, destruction was the failsafe. It stopped um, anybody pressing the trigger and or pushing the button. You know, both expressions which now disappeared from our language, I suppose. But um, I just didn't see it. I just couldn't understand it. And the other thing, too, is that by then um, I'd seen what had happened in NATO exercises in, uh, in Germany where um, the end of any exercise ended automatically with uh, NATO going over to nuclear, going nuclear, because they couldn't ride the punch of the Soviet attack towards the Channel Coast through the North German Plain. And in 1977, I was given the opportunity <coughs> to go to the Soviet Union. I mean, I visited various parts of Eastern Europe, but um, this is the first time to go to um, the Soviet Union. And it came as a fantastic and unpleasant surprise, because what a poverty-stricken group of countries it was. For sure, it had a lot going for it, and. Uh, I thought the Moscow Underground was fantastic, but I just didn't see how they could continue this confrontation with the West, because most of the supermarkets were empty, unless you were uh, one of the officials and you had access to credit cards. But the incident that stuck in my mind, and which made me sh feel that this was uh, completely um, artificial, I wanted to go to Zagorsk, to the tr Monastery of the Holy Trinity, just outside Moscow, and because it's got some com fantastic icon iconography. I just had to see it. And we were on our way there, and suddenly our big Soviet seagull motor car broke down. Now, this was bad enough. This was shocking for our, our guides, for our minders. Um, they were appalled that this had happened because, you know, Soviet machines just didn't break down. So they were getting very upset about this, and we'd stopped in a small village. Now, I should explain that Zagorsk is about as far from Moscow as um, Peebles is from Edinburgh, and so you'd have thought it's not exactly in the back of beyond. But I gently suggested to our translator, I said, look, I could see they were getting really upset. I said, look, why don't, here's a suggestion, we're stopped near some houses, why don't you go and knock on the door and ask them 
if we can, if you ask if you can use the telephone. This was in the days before mobile phones, by the way. No mobile phones then. And I suggested that she should go and ask the occupant of the house to do their citizen's duty and phone the monastery to say that we would be late. This caused even bigger mayhem, and she looked at me eventually and said, Telephone not reach the Gosk. And I thought this is astonishing. Here's a country which is daily threatening us with their, their missiles, and it hasn't got a telephone line from one part of, um, mm. well, so as far as people's. But, but the threat from Soviet tanks was real, and they had some, they had some pretty good tanks. They did indeed. And in fact, that to speak to anybody who served in, in West Germany during the, the Cold War, and they will tell you that the, the threat was real enough. And hence these um, exercises, which were to r as realistic as possible. I mean, a great friend of mine who was an infantry battalion commander during the, first, during, the, during the Cold War said that when they were pulled away on exercise, and w he always used to say to his wife, look, we don't know if this is going to be the real thing or not. Make you, if anything happens, make your way back to Scotland and I'll try to get back once it's all over. Mm. So it wasn't just a training exercise, it was for real. Yeah. Just coming back to Scotland, there was Scotland in the front line, as you describe it, with all these installations, well, observation stations and uh, submarine bases, etc. You look at Scotland now, <coughs> that's all been dismantled. Um, is there a legacy of any kind of that Cold War period? Well, the only real legacy, of course, is the naval base at Fairs Lane. And um, I, I've, for those of you who read the papers at the weekend will know I've got a g very good um, solution for it. Uh, do Scotland, if it becomes independent, should do what Iceland did during the Cold War and r lease Fairs Lane to NATO, just as Iceland did with ca their big base at Keflavik throughout the Cold War. But other than that, I mean, if you look at um, modern day Scotland, there's very little left from the Cold War. Although I'm delighted to read that the Barnes and Quarry bunker is about to open as a tourist attraction next year. It'll, it's owned by the chap who owns a similar tourist attraction of the bunker at um, Anstruther. Edsel, well, it's um, not much left there, although the air bases could be reactivated. Saxaford, we've said it's been reactivated. Kinloss and uh, Lucas have disappeared as air bases, which means that the, air, the Northern Watch is now maintained by um, aircraft from Lossiemouth. But basically, it's as if the Cold War never happened. Um, it's gone completely. And there have been other casualties as well from, from the Cold War period. Um, my opposite number, in the Soviet Union, um, he became a casualty, and in fact, a very high-level casualty. I was very sorry to hear this, because it happened in the dying days of the Cold War, when um, during one of those dreary diplomatic spats between the West and, uh, and the Soviets, with the, with the diplomats being expelled and um, people not having visas renewed, and my opposite number in the Soviet Writers' Union was amongst those who, 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 who was punished. Um, he had his visa taken away, and I was phoned by someone in MI5 to tell me this had happened, that he was, um, they said, but it doesn't matter because he'd been promoted. And I said, what do you mean he'd been promoted? Well, he was an assistant secretary, but now he's been promoted deputy secretary, and that means he can't travel, so the question of a visa isn't a problem. But there's something else about your friend that we've discovered. And I said, well, hang on, hang on a second. He's not really a friend of mine, <laughs> sensing trouble. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, he was planning to abscond to the West. And I said, well, how do you know that? And he said, well, well he, builds, he opened a bank account in London. And what he was doing, rascal, he was claiming expenses from the British while at the same time claiming expenses from the Soviets. And with his British expenses, he'd opened a bank account in London. And I thought, well, goodness me, what a rascal. But I couldn't forbear from asking my friend in MI5, I said, look, just as a matter of interest, what bank was he using in London? He said, ah, I'm leaving the best to last. What bank was he using? Coots in the Strand. 
Always had class, that man. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened to him? He's still there. Well, he must be. I've never heard from him since. Ah. And besides which, the Soviet Writers' Union doesn't, the Soviet, <coughs> doesn't, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Because with the end of the Cold War, the Soviet Union um, was closed down, and the Soviet Writers' Union just doesn't exist. It exists yeah. as the Russian yeah. Writers' Union, Writers' yeah. for Peace or something. Now, I'm sure <coughs> there will be questions people will want to ask, but I, just one final question. A second Cold War. I mean, here we have Putin flexing his muscles in Ukraine and Crimea, uh, a real sense of that sort of hostility once again building up against the West. Um, might we be on the verge of a second Cold War? We might be on the verge of a new confrontation with Russia, but it'll be very different from the Cold War confrontation because for a start, the the Soviet <coughs> Union doesn't exist anymore, and it's not backed by the international ideology of international communism. The Soviet Union is weak from a financial point of view. It um, spends less money on, for, on defenses now than it did during the Cold War. And you have to ask too, I always, when I'm asked questions of this kind, I always tr try to see it from the opposition's point of view. And if you, I'm no friend of, um, Putin, or what he stands for, but try and see it from Russia's point of view. In the aftermath of the Cold War, with the expansion of NATO and the European Union, you've got a large block of power, and um, the Russians see it from the point of view of encroachment towards what the countries they know as the near abroad the parts of Russia or former Russia, which were basically a bulwark against um, any attack from the West. So if you look at it from the Russians' point of view, I can see why they feel alarmed by NATO expansionism. And I can see why they feel that they might be under threat. But as for any fresh confrontation, I don't think it'll be of the nuclear kind because I don't think that the strategy of MAD, which I described earlier, would really work in the modern world. And anyway, why should it? Because Russia has already shown what, what it's capable of doing with its um, instantly or easily deniable attacks on individuals. Um, in 2009, when it was threatening Estonia, it managed to get rid of the problem completely through cyberspace by closing down Estonia's um, net, net network, which means that the internet couldn't be accessed and that basically Estonia's economy stopped operating completely. And uh, Russia's great ally in the Middle East, Assad, uh, in Syria, he was able to do the same there by closing down the internet and making sure that the, the opposition couldn't uh, have access to um, Google, you know, so Google might be the key to all this. I mean, that's quite sophisticated stuff. But then at the same time, the very unsophisticated, crude and brutal bumping off of individuals, like the Salisbury poison. Yes. I mean, well, there's sort of two sides of, of, of Russia. On the one hand, you know, incredible sophistication of interfering in elections in the West and all of that kind of thing. And then this sort of sending a bumbling couple, you know, of agents over to carry out a very inept attack on an individual. Is that... Or is that deliberate, do you think, just sending a signal, you know, flexing their muscles? Well, it certainly sent a signal because um, <coughs> what, you know, they paid for it. So the, the agent, and the former agent, mm. and his daughter paid for it with the, the attack on them. For the life of me, and I don't know why Putin didn't turn to the Russian underworld to carry out that attack for them, they'd have done, done it much more efficiently and brutally and w wouldn't have left so many traces. I see, scary stuff. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure there are questions from the audience for, for Trevor. If, if you just stick your hand up and uh, wait for a microphone to come to you. There's one there and one here so far. Perhaps we'll start up there. Is Scotland's geopolitical status still as important as it was during the Cold War? And will that help 
or hinder Scotland when we're independent? Okay. Well, I don't deal with the future. It's not my subject. But um, I, I take your point that Scotland could become independent. Everything seems to point to that happening. Whether it'll happen in my lifetime, I don't know. But yes, it, it will have a, a, an, eff a, an effect because what I was aware of throughout the research process for um, Facing the Bear was the way in which um, there's very little input from, the Sco from Scottish politicians and um, the way people were kept in the dark. And I don't think that would um, be, certainly people wouldn't stand for it now. And if you have a Scottish government with its um, responsibility, a Scottish electorate, who would soon tell the government if they thought they weren't doing their job? So it's bound to be a change, yes. Mm. Yeah. Um. How much evidence did you find in your research uh, about the Highlands being considered as an open testing range for nuclear weapons before uh, the decision was made to test them in Australia? I looked in vain for any evidence of that kind. It was certainly mooted, and in fact, um, it was brought to a fruition through the development at Dunre of the of the. Vulcan um, station, which was used to test the reactors for British, British submarines. But that was about as far as it went. Um, I think that once the destructive power of atom bombs, well, thermonuclear bombs especially, um, became apparent by testing them in, in Australia, um, it just they knew that it, you just couldn't test a weapon of that kind, of that magnitude in, in the British Isles. And so it was quickly dropped. That's as far as I got. But it was there as a possibility. You're absolutely spot on. It's interesting, by the way, that when going, just going back to Macmillan and his negotiations with the Americans, he wanted the submarine base to be in the Highlands. Didn't he, he did indeed, yes. I mean, uh, he knew that he was going to have to give uh, a Scottish base to the Americans enabled to enable the, the Royal Navy to acquire Polaris. And um, he th was worried about it being in the Clyde. Now, everything pointed to the Clyde because it's got access to deep waters. And to the Americans, it had access to Prestwick, very important there. But um, he wanted it to be up at Fort William, at Loch Linney. And he was worried about, the, too, by the proximity of Glasgow because memories of, in the 1950s, the strong party in Scotland, the hegemony in Scotland was the Labour Party. And the unions were very, very powerful entities indeed. And he said, better to have your base up at Loch Linney with a population of sturdy Highlanders instead of the riffraff in Glasgow. <laughs> <laughs> Question here in the uh, middle, ro middle row there. <coughs> well, well, I have to admit to being one of the Glasgow riffraff <laughs> myself. <laughs> Um, I'll buy the book, I promise, uh, Trevor. You didn't mention Macrahanish or Stornoway, both of which I think had enhanced uh, capability for taking American aircraft in the event of the necessity of uh, large-scale American forces coming to deal with something in Europe. But the question I wanted to ask you really was slightly broader, and that's this. Um, is there not a risk, even with Putin, of misjudgment, miscalculation, provocation, real or imagined, uh, and something happening simply because it shouldn't, but because there's no proper understanding on both sides of the argument. And I have particularly in mind the fact that in Kaliningrad now, uh, Russia has deployed nuclear-capable missiles which are capable of reaching Berlin. Yes. Um there's always that danger, and I think we saw that anybody who saw the recent series of films about Chernobyl, or the even more recent film about the sinking of the submarine Kursk, can see what can happen when you have a secret of society which isn't going to um, make uh, any kind of evidence available and will do everything to deny things when they go wrong. And that always is there. And I think that's one of the regrettable hangovers from the, the Soviet Union. Nobody's going to be prepared to um, stand up for something when it's clear 
that mistakes have been made. So that is a problem, yes, and Kaliningrad is, uh, is a, a certain... Um, because although these missiles have been... Um, none of them have been decommissioned. In fact, they've been developed. So much so that Putin is now boasting by the fact that um, he's got a missile that can go faster than the American missiles. And this has just been countered by the, by the Americans as well, that they've got their, theirs is even better. So that kind of rhetoric where people say mine's bigger than yours or mine's faster than yours is always dangerous. But this is where democracy is always good. And you mentioned Stornoway, and indeed that was um, a very important victory for the local community where they managed to keep NATO out of the Stornoway base. And um, that was by being noisy and being positive in their arguments and getting that argument across to people who, who, who would listen. It's a question down here. Going back to the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, do you think the West then missed a trick by its rather aggressive stance and almost gloating stance towards the erstwhile Soviet Union? And instead of wooing or trying to woo places like Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO, that they should have adopted a much more subtle policy towards Russia? Yes, I think that um, NATO expansionism alarmed the Russians, and for very good reasons too, because I've often tried, when I try to explain, uh, you know, Putin's not the most important person or the most popular person in the West, and people are worried about him for all sorts of reasons, but I always try to explain uh, Russians' fear of ex NATO expansionism by referring to the Monroe Doctrine, of the 1820s. Um, this was in, uh, introduced by the United States to prevent further Russian, um, further European expansion close to their borders. And it's quite simple, really. You don't want to have a potential enemy setting up a uh, setting up house near you. And more could have been done. I think more could have been done, too, to help the Soviet economy, or the old Soviet economy, because the way Russia developed in the, or failed to develop, in the in the aftermath of the of the collapse of the Cold War, I think really shamed all of us. Yeah, actually, um, you mention a very important figure, who during the Cold War was a conduit based in Scotland uh, between the Soviet Union and the West at a time when there was very little communication. It was precisely this kind of dialogue was through Professor John Erickson at Edinburgh University. I mean, he was really important, wasn't he? Yes, John Erickson is one of the, one of the giants of um, academic writing. He's a great expert on the Soviet Union during the Second World War, and especially in the Soviet Army. Now, John Erickson was an extraordinary <coughs> man. He was professor at Edinburgh University. And while the Cold War was still in process, while there was still an off... Uh, a possibility, a distinct possibility, in the 1980s of, go of going to war with the Soviet Union, he instituted these conversations. They were known as the Edinburgh Conversations. They were um, bipolar. They were between we the West and East. They took one year. They took part place one year in Moscow and the next year in Edinburgh. And for that brief period, Edinburgh was central to Cold War planning. There's a question right in the middle there another here. The incident that took place in the early 1980s where uh, Russia had thought that it was under attack by the West and a Soviet officer countermanded the retaliation instructions, had he not acted in that matter, was that it? Would that have automatically triggered a uh, full-scale nuclear war between East and West. Such was the state of command and control at that period that, yes, it could have done, but that man understood what the real position was. And there was another incident in 1983, um, Abel Archer. This was an annual exercise undertaken by NATO, um, which tried to plot the process from conventional war to nuclear war. And the Soviets at one point thought, uh, during the course of this exercise, became convinced that the real thing was about to happen, but it didn't. But if you look to everything, every incident during the Cold War, when there was almost uh, an outbreak and it didn't happen, 
you'd see that it was a, a knife edge, yeah. There's another question here. Could a case be made that Britain is in contravention of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, in that we're not engaging with, uh, in good faith with the possibility of a disar disarmament? Uh, you know, what's to stop our government engaging with the UN Treaty uh, banning nuclear weapons? Well, I think there's a danger that if Scotland, were, if Scotland were to become independent, it would have to sign up to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and um, that seems not to have been addressed yet. I think that is a worry, yes. Well, actually, just, sorry, was that, were you holding up a hand? Yes, there's another question here. Just hang on to the microphone, get there. Uh, the question really is to do with um, um, uh, the broadcasting of more, in an our open society, of more knowledge about the thinking processes behind the entity, the civilization that appears to be our enemy. I just want to chip in for the benefit of all that uh, are we Scotland facing the bear? Should land you the uh, This, in 1960, the Scottish Education Department and put about new choices on the Scottish education syllabus. And it was, in fact, to get immigrants to teach Russian and actually to emphasize even German. The idea being that the more you study the history and the civilizations and orthodoxy and where we've all come to, like um, Gibbon and, and um, Toynbee, you understand your enemy. So there's a case for bringing in Slavic studies and the... Uh, um, bring it into the syllabus when kids are quite young and get an understanding early. If you don't understand them, you can't read their own languages and thinking. So I'm just wondering, it's a wee sadness that Slavic studies have dropped off our studies. We're bringing more Arabic studies in or Chinese studies, but the wonderful bit about a society that can educate its whole populace to be able to read and be more understanding of those who look like being our enemies and uh, we might avoid these near misses and mistakes. Mm. Well, the Joint Service School of Languages was at Creel and Fife, and as that's where um, a lot of, uh, lot of where, where, where Russian was taught. Um, and by the way, that question goes far wider of, uh, along the whole spectrum of languages and how they are taught, and, uh, and maybe it applies too to Europe. But we are not we are going to have a Brexit-free discussion <laughs> here because time has run out and luckily we don't have any opportunity of getting into that. So can I, in the meantime, uh, just say that Trevor will be signing books in the signing tent that way, but in the meantime, would you join with me in thanking Trevor Royal? <laughs> <laughs>